name is Melissa Nalbat. I'm the scenic charge artist at La Jolla Playhouse. Uh, I definitely took a windy road to get to this point. I actually used to work in finance for eight years and I then left my job, went back to school, um, started photography, ended up taking some art classes, which then led me to uh, Cobalt Studios, which is a studio in upstate New York. Um, it's a working studio where she does backdrops um, for the theater industry, but then also takes on about eight students every two years. And you live there and you work together all day learning um, scenic art techniques. Um, and then also having other professors come in, like Susan Crabtree, who's written a bunch of uh, theatrical books. Um, and you're learning hands-on of all different scenic art techniques, primarily for backdrops, so doing two-dimensional work to make it look three-dimensional. When I was graduating, there was a job opportunity that was posted on a scenic forum on Yahoo Groups to age ourselves a little bit. Um, that they were looking for scenic artists in San Diego. I actually ended up interviewing at USITT uh, conference and then was one of two people chosen to come and work for eight weeks, kind of like as a test run. And then it ended up working out and then moved to San Diego from New York to uh, be a scenic artist. And then about two years into that, is when our split happened and then a job opportunity opened up to actually run the department. And that's what I've been doing for the last three to four years. So I just wanted to show you some samples of uh, that we have from past shows. So a lot of times what we use in theater is we can't create the actual thing. So a lot of the substrate that we use on most tends to be a lot is actual foam. So one of our fun examples here is the dirt mound. This was from a show called Last Tiger in Haiti. And so they wanted to feel as though the actors were on a dirt mound around the stage. So we obviously weren't able to bring in dirt into the theater, and it was also important that the actors be able to walk on it and the actors were gonna be barefoot. So what we ended up doing here is if I rotate it, you'll see that it was made up of laying and gluing together um, different foam that we had. So also then on the top one, we tried to use more of a heavyweight foam because that's a little bit harder so it could withstand people walking on it. And then you can see here, what then we ended up doing was about, again, applying that texture, the elastomeric, along with um, strips of muslin. Now it was important to do strips of muslin, not a whole sheet of it, because if we did that, all this carving detail that was underneath there would just go away because the minute it would start to dry being the muslin, it would just expand and then you would lose all this great detail of the carving underneath. So it was important to use little strips, kind of like doing paper mache, but with fabric. So that just helped create this harder texture, but yet it's still soft to the touch for the actors and then, you know, pine paint and spatter. But we also needed to create rocks and we couldn't actually put sharp rocks on it since they were gonna be barefoot. So this is just actually a cushion from your couch that was ripped up and then dipped into the elastomeric. So you can see here, you can squish it and touch it. And it's really soft and rubbery here. And then you're able to actually stand on it. Another sample we have here is actually from the show Come From Away. The designer, uh, Beowulf, actually wanted real trees, but we usually don't do that in theater because that leads to um, structural issues. Sometimes they'll fall apart, bugs and whatnot. So we try to avoid putting anything real on stage. So this again was made out of foam. The foam they bought here was half round with already cut out for this to go onto a substructure, probably made of metal to support it. And then again, they did um, a layer of fabric. This time they used dew, which is a lot thicker black material. And then once they put it on there, they did scrape it up so it helped create the ridges. And then that fabric also was a lot thicker and denser. And then again, they applied texture over it and then paint, and it made some pretty realistic looking um, bark. <laughs> Other types of wood. Here's an example from Fly in which that we had our sub uh, structure was made out of metal while also having bamboo right next to it. And what's also important in theater is that no one is gonna be looking at it this close. It's really important of how it looks when you step back. So obviously up close, these you can clearly tell, okay, this is metal because it doesn't have the ridges of the bamboo and it also has bolts and welts sticking out. But we were able to that, we knew that from afar, it was still gonna be effective 
So this one was a pretty basic treatment of, we used just that base color wood. And then we just came in with like two different colored glazes and literally just brushed it on, stippled it in some way. Sometimes we would try to be directional in that because you do see on the bamboo, because this bamboo here is actually just like in its natural state. We did nothing to this bamboo because this is before it's like cleaned and processed to make that like clean bamboo that you see a lot. So we were very fortunate that the bamboo that came to us already kind of had this like aging and patina to it. So then it was like pretty simple for us to then just come in and stipple some um, glazes over the metal to then make them seem cohesive. Uh, just talking about the stacks of book that were in the show, this is the image that we received from the designer and then she just gave us journal numbers like she wanted three stacks ranging from like three feet, four feet to five feet high. Our props department worked on this and they used actual book, actual books and then they like ripped out the pages and just used the hard covers and um, but they were life size books and then once they got them on stage the designer and the director right away were like too small. We need something bigger. We want them to be really big overdrawn books so that they actually read from the audience. So then, because we had a little bit of time right at hand, then that got passed to us and it was like, all right, how can we make this? But it also has to be lightweight to fly in the air. So we were like, all right, we'll make them out of foam. So we did start by just making square cuts of the foam we have in different widths, just to, and different, in different sizes. Um, and then when the, uh, Jen, the scenic artist, started to carve it. She did carve one of the books out on the edges so that you could see the actual um, book cover and we would create an indent. And then we found that that took her over a half hour to do. And we knew how many we had to do. And we were like, we just don't have the time for that. So immediately we're like, all right, pause, let's think about it. Then we remembered that we had this um, self-sticking um, like poem, poem? <laughs> foam uh, I think it's primarily used in plumbing or something so we were actually able to get that in different widths and depth and then just glue those because they had stickies just stick them on right to the object and then we were able to create that effect of it being a book book cover edge without and that took you know two minutes as opposed to 30 plus minutes so that was then what we did and then eventually we just stacked them all and then gooped them in texture. Um, what we use a lot here is um, a product called The Last America that we get at Home Depot. They do sell a theatrical version of it, but this is a much more economical one to use. And it's just kind of like, um, it dries to a more flexible um, finish, I guess, uh, that makes it uh, great to use as a protector, for, especially for foam, because you can't paint directly to foam, it doesn't like that. And then it helped us create a cohesive look and we were able to drag like a comb through the sides and that gave us the effect of books. So once we do have a process figured out, then we'll have either myself or one of the scenic artists do a sample to be able to show a designer. And it, what's really important is that we document what our steps are because sometimes you could be the person that did the sample and for whatever reason, you might not be the person that actually does the actual work when time comes. So it's really important for us to write down our process, always give a little swatch of what color you use, in what order, um, how you made it, and also um, like what your recipe for the paint was. And then in the steps in which you did it, where it was like, oh, you use this color in the routed lines on the board so that anyone, say you were on the, you had to step away from the project, someone can pick up where you left off. And also they can reference the sample piece that you had to see what exactly it was. So with that, it is important also when you're visually doing your samples to show the steps that you do do so that someone could see it, say they didn't have the notes, they could at least come here and be like, oh, okay, I see you did four steps and I could see what progressively changed each step. Um, this one here is a great sample we love to show because a lot of what we do here is just make wood look like other wood. So um, a lot of the wood that we use here in theater is MDF, which is medium density fiber board. Um, and in this particular sample here, they obviously wanted it to look like um, it had wood with a grain in it. So you can see here, their first step was just a generic um, wood base coat. Um, then they came in and that's actually where you get a lot of the grains or at least the um, subgrains in here. So then step two here is where they did a wood grain, which I'll show you in a little bit, a sample of that. 
Then they applied a glaze over that just to change the warmth and overall color of the wood. And then I don't know if you can see on the camera, there are actually two different finishes on that. So um, if they wanted a more glossy one or a more of a satin finish. But this here is just a great example of a sample board then that anyone, any scenic artist would be able to pick up and be like, okay, I know what you did here and recreate that for you. So what we're gonna do here is just a quick little demo of how we can achieve a quick um, faux wood grain. So I have a piece of wood here. I already put a, a base coat. This is kind of like our generic wood um, base coat that we use. And then I will show you what we have here are two glazes. So this actually is just a glaze or a matte medium that then has some color tint in it, just to whatever color you need. So what we're gonna do here, always wet your brushes before you use them, unless you're doing dry brushes. It just helps the wear of your brushes and makes cleaning a lot easier. And then we're just gonna dump it into the glaze and then we're just gonna put it on. Now, if you needed to do a really, really quick wood grain, you could just use a chip brush like this and just go like this and you kind of already have a pretty very basic generic wood grain but if you wanted something more pronounced they have a variety of wood graining tools ones that you just hold by hand some are rollers some are half round with a quarter round I should say with a handle or sometimes you can even just buy um, the sheets of it and put it around something round yourself like a can or uh, a dowel and just have a piece of rubber band or something on it but you do just take your tool and you drag it and then as you drag it you're going to rock it so they call it a rocking tool and then you'll see that it'll give yourself a nice uh, wood grain and then say you don't like that you just go by the way that just do that over and then i'm like well maybe i like this tool instead this is the wrong way to do this one. Oop. And then you can get a different one. Now, if uh, say I was jerky the whole way. It is important to be smooth as you're rocking it, because A, if I don't rock it at all, I just have that, which actually isn't so bad sometimes too. <laughs> but now I should create one that doesn't look good. But if you're jerky along the way and you go curvy, like you'll get some really wonky wood, which is not what you want unless someone wanted some really abstract wood. This is really helpful if you're using more of a thicker product, like a crystal gel or something, but we can also see though that you could still create it, different lines with it. So. Again, I a lot of times, I'm not gonna lie, I just do it chip brush one and you can do your little lines in it and then just come and try all different things. Just show you the scraper again. If you want to turn it at different angles, that will give you some lines too, which is nice too when you're using it alongside a graining tool. If it's really important that it's known what type of wood it is, like if it's a fancier wood, you definitely are gonna look at your research, uh, whether that's Google images or actual pieces of wood, because some of the finer woods do have a very distinct grain in them. And then in those cases, a lot of times you're probably gonna end up hand painting that. But um, I would do your research and that's also a key question to ask the scenic designer. Are they looking for what type of wood that is that they are looking for? But um, it, it's really about, it, do they want them to know that it's a nicer type of wood or not? And then it's important to do the grain. But if they're just like, ah, I just want it to look like wood, which I've had before, then you can get away with just doing a chip brush technique. The last sample we have is, this was from a show called Up Here, where they were gonna be going through a museum, so they wanted these two giant wooden totems, which we weren't gonna make out of wood because it's quite heavy and quite tall. So again, they were just made out of foam. And then we um, did like a pretty basic drawing of the totem pole that he wanted, and then started to carve out the shapes then again, we, uh, we used the elastomeric. I don't think this one actually had any fabric put on it because no one was going to be walking on it. It was just going to be coming on stage and going off. So you could see here, there is the texture 
And then they applied it with a chip brush, I believe also. And she also had like maybe one of the graining tools with the edges cut out just to create those streaks within it. Um, then it was painted brown. And then there was um, darkening of uh, a darker brown was used in the recesses just to help make them pop a little bit more. Because anywhere you add darkness, it will recede. Anywhere where you put lighter, brighter colors, it will um, come forward at you. Other big thing we do in theater is flooring, which we also refer to as the deck. Um, this example here was from a show called Wild Goose Dreams. Uh, Wild Goose Dreams actually had a wood deck and then was surrounded by a moat with real water in it. And the actors would walk in and out of the water barefoot. So then they'd be walking on stage barefoot with wet feet. So it was really important that we didn't create a slippery surface for them. This actually is dimensional and we ended up using the elastomeric once again, because that is a waterproof material. It's actually a roofing material. So this was applied that same way in that demo where we just brushed it on and then ran the graining tool through that to give us this graining effect. And then um, did a few washes on it again, making their uh, recess areas more dark. So this was actually cut out on the CNC machine which thankfully we have here. So the people up in the tech office will write a program, send it down to the computer, and then that'll cut out certain shapes, whatever we want in um, wood, metal, foam, all uh, kinds of products. So this one, they actually cut out the groove for us. So we just had to make sure we put, you know, a darker color in there. And this was the sample that we showed to the designer. And what's nice about it is someone actually wrote the steps on the back. <laughs> here so that if someone had to recreate this, they could pretty much do that just by following these steps here. Um, and then obviously using the uh, front side of the visual sample. Uh, this just here is just a quick sample to show you uh, marbling that we also do, um, which is pretty cool because a lot of times this marbling texture is actually achieved using a feather and you just drag it in the paint and then just drag it across um, your surface and it'll give you those nice little veins for uh, a marble effect. So this is a pretty simple but effective sample where from afar you're like, oh yeah, that looks like a marble floor. And then just one more is making wood look like metal. So this was used for, I believe it's Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood. So we needed to make a metal looking truss, but of course it wasn't gonna be made out of metal. It was made out of wood. So what actually what we used here is just the spray foam insulation that you would use like say around your windows inside your home. So they just sprayed it throughout and then which maybe not the greatest thing before it fully cures. If you come and press it down, you can manipulate it and get it a little bit more flatter and also control its expansion because it can expand pretty, pretty well, uh, largely. And then also in order to create the rivets, all this is, this is actually a googly on it that we got and we just spray painted them black. So then it's just easy enough just to glue it on and then it's super lightweight and um, pretty effective. And then again, just painting and glazing an agent however you need.